Howdy, everybody. I hope you all are doing all right. All right. So I have no clue what UWU means. That's from Shadow95. UWU. I'll kind of look that up if I have to. UWU. What does that mean? Oh, it's a, a smiley face. Huh. I didn't know that. Google is cool. Hello, Kayla and Anthony. Nice to see you guys here. All right. So I hope you guys have had a great week. And hello, Gabriel. Nice to see all you guys. So, what's up? Who's got the first question? I'll play a little bit while we're waiting, okay? Well, you know, technically there's not a difference. But because the, the equipment... So here's the thing. Is equipment does have a, a, an impact on how clear the notes are, right? So, and, and, and I think... You know how people are always saying... Oh, that's a high note trumpet, and that's a, uh, a a regular trumpet. That's a high note trumpet, and some people say that's classical and jazz. But jazz isn't just about high notes. So, um, or they'll say um, that's a high note mouthpiece or a regular mouthpiece. I think what they're hearing, what they're experiencing, is that. When you play higher, so like for example, now I, it's been so long since I've played high. I've not played much above the staff in months. So let's see how this goes. And I, I don't like just playing scales up there, so I'm going to do a little improv. <laughs> So, as you can see, that the, what's what's amazing about that? I'm I'm not saying I'm amazing. I haven't played any high notes in months. I'm not exaggerating. I have not played any high notes in months. And the fact that I could do stuff up, I think I, if I'm not mistaken, my highest note right now was a D above super C on a mouthpiece that's that deep on this bathtub of a trumpet. Um, yeah, so, so what we're talking about right now is does the, does the instrument affect the high notes? And the instrument does affect the high notes. It doesn't affect whether you can get them. That's, that's why I'm, I say technically it doesn't have any effect. It doesn't affect whether you can get them. What it affects 
hugely is what it sounds like. So I have another horn. Let me grab this horn. I'll get to you guys' other questions real quick. All right, so I think I mentioned this before on another Q&A. This is not my trumpet. This is my son's trumpet. I bought it for him for his birthday one year, probably about 10 years ago, I think. But, and I didn't get it because it was a lead trumpet. I bought it for him because it was cheap. <laughs> and I knew I was getting a good deal out of it. Um, I think I paid 400 for it. And it's, but it's a great lead horn. So I'm gonna do something similar to what I just did. Right? On this horn, that kind of playing is going to be more pronounced. It's going to have a more resonant sound up there because on this horn, which is like a bathtub, um... The, the the notes up there are too tubby, okay? Anyway, so I hope that makes sense. So it's not so much that the cornet or the trumpet are more difficult to play or easier to play. The cornet is gonna tend to be more mellow sounding. So mellow doesn't work so well in terms of what we hear on the high notes. The mechanics of what we do is the same. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, Kayla says, I'm a senior in the midst of my college search process. Good. Any recommendations on what I should look out for in trumpet professors and music departments? I want to major in music education. So if you want to major in music education, I would say make that your top priority. Don't worry about um, so much who the trumpet professors are, and that, but that's how priorities work. Is that, that would be your first priority, right? And so then, sec so that, I'm not saying that's not a good question. It is a good question. I'm just saying don't put this above looking for a good education school. Okay. So, um, and let me give you an example of that. I went to, my first university was UTEP. I was there for five years. I won't go into money much detail there, <laughs> but um, I, didn't, didn't, I don't have a degree. I've got many years of school and no degree, and that, all because of mistakes I made. Um, but I was there five years full time, and it, it was an awesome school for, for education for learning how to be a band director or whatever. Um, extremely awesome. And it's a school nobody's ever heard of. And I don't think you really have to have a famous school. You know what I would look at is, and I know this doesn't answer your question. Sorry about that. What I would look at is how many of the band directors at the school I mean, how many of the students at the school are getting assigned to band director gigs after they graduate? That's an important number to look at. And I don't know how you would look that up, but that's an important number, okay? So um, now, what to look for in a trumpet teacher? You know, I don't... I don't know that I would say... See, I'm not one of those guys that thinks that there's so many bad teachers out there. There's bad things being taught sometimes. But I don't know that you could find out who who's teaching what before you go. I, I don't know how you would do that, right? Here's something I have said in the past, is if you like the way their students sound, 
then that's probably a great school for you. But I normally say that to people who are majoring in performance. And I would definitely say that in, in that context, right? If you want to be a performance major, then you um, look at not necessarily how that person plays, but how the students play. If you like the way they play, then that's a great school for you. That's something I wish I had done when I was um, that age. I wish I had looked at the different students. And you know what? It's so easy to do that today because you can go to their websites or find out who the students are and, and look them up on YouTube and stuff like that. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. That's the main thing I would look at is do you like the way their, te their students sound? Gabriel says, is there any small movement in, on the upper lip? I can't feel any sensation on it. So, now, let me do some. No, I don't think, I don't think you're going to feel much on the top lip. I don't think you feel much on the top lip. And all of those movements become more subtle as you go higher, right? Anthony says, I played my, oh, no, this is Monty 15. <laughs> Monty 15. Hello, Eddie. Hope you're doing good. I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, Anthony says, I played my cornet the other day in my practice, and my wife was in the kitchen, and, and I was playing in middle register, not high. She said that after my playing, the cornet sounded brighter in pitch, than the trumpet. That happens, yes. It, yes, it is possible. Um, so the, the cornet is a kind of interesting animal because of the way the overtones work and the, 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 if you blow into it a certain way, it can have a brighter sound. It's true. And, and also, there's also the the um, acoustic stuff, right? And, and that can happen too. Okay. But yes, it is possible. Gabriel says, I added some weight under my cornet pistons and it sounds much better and much easier now. Yeah. Um, we were talking about that a couple weeks ago, right? We were talking about the, or was that in an email? That might have been in the email that we were talking about that. Um, what's his name? Nick Drostoff. Nick Drostoff has some wonderful articles about the physics of trumpet playing. And that's one of the things I learned from him was how the weighted stuff works. I don't use any weighted stuff, but I understand how it works and that I do know now understand that it is a legitimate way of of um, getting some results. So God, Anthony's asking Gabriel if the weighted caps work. And Anthony said, I mean, Gabriel says, yes, I tried them with bottom caps, but at the end I made the upper caps too, and now it is very balanced one. Oh, that sounds cool. I didn't even know they had upper ones. Um, oh, you're welcome, Kayla. Anthony says, what make a cornet, cornet? And Gabriel says, it's a king cornet. Kings are nice. Hello, Bota. Nice to see you. Anthony says he's got a con, Caprion. Okay, Santo Domingo says... Hi, Mr. Lewis. Hope you are fine. I am. Thank you. I'm saving money to buy a flugelhorn, and I have noticed some have vertical slides and other horizontal slides like a trumpet. Is any difference in sound between those designs? I have no clue. <laughs> I don't think it would make much of a difference. 
I really don't. Um, you, you know, um, let me let me get my flugelhorn, my old flugelhorn out. Um, I want to show you something. Uh, I think it's in here. I now have a lot of horns. I never had horns like that before, and I it, and even used to it even used to bother me seeing all these other guys with horns. I used to make fun of them because I had this this philosophy back in the old days <laughs> before I grew up, which was very. I think what was that? I was 55 when I grew up, or something like that. <laughs> I had this philosophy that guys that had a bunch of horns weren't really good players, <laughs> because everybody I knew that was a great player only had like two horns. But now I've got a bunch of horns. Um, notice I took off the brace right here, which was a stupid move. I'm not telling you to do this. Don't do what I did, okay? That's one of the reasons why this horn is, is um, on its last leg, okay? Um, because that brace is there for a reason, to protect this, this uh, lead pipe, right? Um, but I took it off because I wanted, in theory, to have the maximum distance of vibrating surface area, right? without any so if you look i've got a, a weld right here that connects the bell to the the valve casing but everything else is free that's one of the reasons why i took off the pinky ring on my flugel you see that no pinky ring and one of the reasons for the pinky ring gone is because i wanted that to be free vibrating surface and yes, it's got a gorgeous sound. Um, and, and in fact, it's a got a very characteristic sound. And I don't know where my mouthpiece is. <laughs> oh, maybe it's in the case. So between, between taking the, the lacquer off and taking the the brace off and the, the finger ring and having this deep, deep, deep mouthpiece, this flugelhorn has a sound unlike anybody else's sound, right? And I, I know that the, the, the laptop microphone probably doesn't do this justice. And so this horn, man, oh man. Um, the only reason I even started looking for a new flugel horn is because of the, the wear and tear. This horn isn't going to last forever and I needed a new, new horn. So for two reasons. One, so I have a backup in case this goes out. And then also to help this one last longer. We were talking about that last week, right? Uh, Anthony asked if you have six different trumpets, will that make them last longer if you're playing on each one of them? And that, that's how it works. It's, it's math, right? If you spread the wear and tear around on six different horns, they're not going to be as worn out. Um, this I got this, trump, this flugelhorn in 1980. And it has been all over the world with me. And as you can see, um, I, for a long time, for like 30 years, I played it on almost every gig. This, this horn has more mileage on it than it, in, in terms of performance than any other horn that I have ever had. So, and, and that's why it sounds so unique. It's because of the work I did on it. So, um, 
Now, why am I saying that? I can't remember why we were talking about that. Oh, about the Fugo. Someone asked about Santo Domingo. Asked about um, the the flugel horns. I got off on a tangent. Sorry about that. Um, but no, I don't think that the, the the way that the slide goes makes that much of a difference. I really don't. Oh, Anthony, never. That's that's not a problem. You guys can have it. I'm enjoying. The only reason I was reading your conversation is because I want other people to enjoy it. I don't think everybody can actually um, see what's going on over here. That's why I read them out loud. Okay. So, yeah, Anthony says, sorry, Eddie. I hope you don't mind the cross conversation between me and Gabriel. I don't mind at all. Gabriel says, uh, Eddie, I was listening to Mr. Gatala. And I noticed his attack is not clean, but with a pleasant sound of air on the beginning of each note, which makes the sound very soft. Yes, I believe what you're talking about is that thing he taught me with a TH attack instead of the instead of the T attack. The 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 instead of ta ta ta. We talked about that last week too. Instead of ta 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 is da 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 da. Right. In fact, we were talking about that with you because you want you wanted to know what you could do to make the Artunian more resonant. And I think that goes a long way towards that, because it's not only because it, it softens the beginning of the note, but it also pulls your tongue down farther in your mouth. So. Um, so. Bota, no, I actually don't have all that. So Bota's saying, do you still have the bracing and the pinky ring? And that was a long, long time ago. I held on to it for a long, long time. But I've moved house four or five times since then. And in the shuffle, it's been gone. <laughs> so, yeah, it's gone. So Javier says, hello, Eddie. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. I hope you've been well. Um, so Santo Domingo says, thanks for the answer. My older flugels don't have, oh, why do other older flugels don't have third valve triggers? And I don't know the answer to that. It's just, you know what? All the old horns don't have. Um, I don't think playing in tune in the old days was as big of a deal as it is today. Not, Don't get me wrong. Everybody had to play in tune. But, you know, sort of like working in a machine shop where you have tolerances, right? Um, and I think... Today, the tolerances are much tighter when it comes to playing in tune. I think in the old days, you just did what you did, and everybody just knew that horns were going to have certain idiosyncrasies, right? So, Javier says, read the out... <laughs> he says, reading the out loud makes it the streaming more fun. <laughs> He says, started the Total Tonalization book. Great book. Good. The subconscious thing that this tonalization patterns do is great. Thank you. Yes. You know what is amazing about that is I, and, and, and it's not nice to do this. Um, it's not nice to do this, but I've done it like not on purpose, but there were situations that arose like, Maybe the student needed to do an etude or something or an audition, usually something more like an audition. And let's say they've let's say they're brand new to the tonalization study, so they haven't been through all the different keys yet. And therefore they don't have that skill yet. And but the audition stuff would be in five sharps, something way over their head. So we'll start 
instead of jumping into the etude, you start with the, the tonalization studies first because it changes the way you think. If you do the tonalization studies first before you work on a, an etude or a piece or something, you'll make less mistakes when you learn the, the etude. That's just the way it is, right? So we would, we would pull out the tonalization studies for that key, even though they're not ready for that key yet. And what's amazing about that, the, because it's almost in order of difficulty, almost. The most difficult ones, in my opinion, are numbers 17, 18, 19, 20. No, no, I'm sorry. What am I saying? No, 12, 13, 14, 15, no, 13, 13 14, 15, 16. It's the fourths, right? Um, the fourths are the ones that are the hardest ones. And then we go to the triads, which are not as hard. It just was a more logical progression to go that way. So, but definitely the easiest ones are the three note ones and then the four note ones and thirds, right? And what's amazing is you watch these students that don't have any skill in this key whatsoever and they make a lot of mistakes on the first one. Just a tiny bit less mistakes on the second one. Fewer mistakes on the third one. When they get 10, 12 exercises into it, they're not making any mistakes anymore, even though the exercises are getting harder. That is clear, clear evidence that the subconscious stuff that you're talking about is working. They're playing harder material, but making fewer mistakes. So, yeah. Javier says, I got a question about embouchure. I do sometimes, and I've seen this too in other people. They make this air cushion thing. Yes. Oh, but holding some air inside the mouth is is this okay i would say it is okay i'm i'm not going to say that it's ideal okay it seems to help with mouth muscle resistance when i'm tired so a lot of people do that even pros Okay, and I've found in editing my own videos, I've found myself getting a little bit of a pocket up here sometimes. Um, now, I'm trying not to do that. Well, the time that it's been happening to me is when I'm playing low. I'm, I can't actually make it happen. <laughs> See how I let that puff up? And um, I've been in the video. I don't realize it when, I, when I'm recording the video, but when I'm doing the editing, I'll see that puff up like that. And I'm actually trying now to stop doing that because it's not ideal. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. A lot of professionals do it. Um. And yes, I don't, I don't think there's a problem with it. In fact, I have friends that puff up up here underneath the, the, the lip. And it tends to be that those guys have a lot of great range, right? They play with a push, uh, uh, a, a air cushion up here. And um, yeah, so... Gabriel says, why is puffing cheeks considered a, an issue? Okay, so if you look at what the ideal, <laughs> if you look at the ideal um, embouchure, right? The ideal embouchure has all these muscles from the face as a network of muscles, right? But if you look at the anatomy of the face, 
there's a bunch of muscles that go across like this. Then there's muscles that go across like this, like a smaller version of my hand. And then there's muscles that go across like this. Then in the middle of all that, we've got the obicularis oris, okay? And so in an ideal situation, those, each of those muscles that I showed you here, right? Each of those muscles are working against the obicularis oris, each one of them pulling um, against that muscle to hold it flat against the lips and make it taut so that it vibrates at the frequency we want it to. If we take some of those muscles and relax them, that's the only way you're going to get a puffing cheek, is that some of those muscles are now relaxed. then other muscles have to take up the slack with the balance. I hope that makes sense. So, Bolta says, well, Anthony says Dizzy puffed his cheeks. That's true. And um, <laughs> Javier says that maybe it's just an aesthetic thing. <laughs> Look, I, I'm assuming you're saying it looks like a squirrel. Uh -huh. And then Bolta says, Chuck Finley has a great interview about that. He uses his puffing cheeks to get a different sound. I, I can, that, it, that aligns with what I'm saying, right? If you, dis, if you redistribute that balance of muscles, right? So we have the muscles that come down this way, muscles that come this way, muscles that come this way. If we relax any of those, it's going to put different uh, leverage, I guess would be a, a word for it. It's, it is leverage. It's just a very technical form of leverage, right? So um, not technical, very complicated, I, uh, what I mean. Complex is the actual word. Complex a pl application of leverage because you got so many, what do you call them, um, vortexes, vertices in, in there where you have all these different things connected. Um, but if you relax some of them, then the other ones are going to have to make up for it. So you might have instead a lip that's spread out more or, or puckered in more. And yes, it's going to change the, the sound, but it's also going to change your ability to have endurance, right? So, um, so think about that. If, if you let some of the muscles relax, that means the other muscles have to work harder. See how that works. It's a balance. If you, if you let some muscles relax, the other muscles have to work harder and it's going to affect your your um your endurance it will affect your sound too so so yes that's but the 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 way your question was worded is it okay yes it's okay i'm not one of those teachers that so I don't make you sit at attention. I don't make you hold the horn a certain way. Um, I, so when it comes to different embouchures, the only time we will talk about changing an embouchure or anything like that is when it's causing a problem. And if you look at the, the huge number of great players out there, there's a, a, a wide array of different types of embouchures and they all make them work beautifully, okay? <laughs> Anthony says, Vizzuti was puffing his cheeks when he was demonstrating a super fast clerk study number two. I'll have to check that out. Um, now, was he not uh, circular breathing? 
right? Because you have to puff your cheeks to circular breathe. I don't know if he ever did. I don't know if he does circular breathing. You know, my favorite album of his for a while, uh, I haven't heard it in years. He he did a recording with with um, Chick Corea one time. And I thought that was a, a, a very, very cool combination, Alan Rizzuti with Chick Corea. It was with that record label that went out of business. I think they went out of business, Electra. It was, and I think that was, I think that was Chick Corea's only recording with Electra. You know who else made a recording with Electra? It was a great recording, it was Freddie Hubbard. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he did a recording with Electra called Ride Like the Wind or something like that. Fantastic recording. And in fact, there's a YouTube video showing behind the scenes how the, the album was recorded. Yeah, it's possible that he was using circular breathing, Anthony. Oops, sorry. So, what else do we got? It looks like I'm going to be playing a lead gig out of coming out of all this not playing, not playing, not playing for months and months and months. My first gig coming up is actually a, a, a month from today. It's the I think the fifteenth or sixteenth of November, and um, I have to play lead trumpet, and it's, I think I mentioned last week, it's, the, it's like the loudest group that I play with, so, <laughs> Javier asks, am I going to upload a video from that gig? Um, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't like that gig at all. Oh, I hope people aren't watching this. <laughs> um, let me clarify what I mean by that. I like the gig. I like the social aspect of it. The music aspect of it is horrible. And the reason it's horrible is because it's so loud that there's no way the quality could be any good. It's so extremely loud. And, um, you know, you got, it's, it's, not, it's not just what it does to our playing. Yes, that's part of it. When we have to play that loud, tone goes out the window, technique goes out the window, flexibility goes out the window, Expression and style goes out the window. Um, we lose all of that. So that's that's part of it. But also, you can't hear cues and 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 people are getting lost all the time. And it's just no, I won't I won't record those kind of gigs. <laughs> Do you know what I call that? I call that work. Gabriel says. Um, Eddie, did you use your usual piece on that lead trumpet before? Um, you're talking about this. My, my son's horn. Um, so I've only ever used this. This is my lead mouthpiece. And I, I've only ever used this mouthpiece on this horn. So... I when I first bought it, and it, it, I I told you I gave it to him for Christmas, but he didn't know that, right? So I had a a, a lead gig on for for Christmas at a church, and so I played on his horn before I gave it to him, and I'll never forget. Um, I'll never forget how um. 
easy it was to play that stuff with that with that instrument. So Anthony says, Eddie, why so loud? Personally, I don't think it needs to be that loud. It's a Baptist church, believe it or not, with louder than rock volume, uh, rock concert volume music. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a Baptist church up in Northwest Houston. And um, it's just so loud that the quality of what we do is compromised. Um, but I think it's part of that culture. And I won't say any more about it than, than that. I think it's just part of that culture. Because God has to hear it. <laughs> I'm here, it says, because God has to hear it. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, when... Never mind. <laughs> you know, that might actually be how they think. Um, and I don't mean that as a derogatory statement. But... Um, that might be the, the idea is that it's got to be um, a joyful noise, so to speak, right? So, so yes, I, I don't want to make it sound like I don't like the gig. I like the gig, right? I, I like the people mostly. And um, it's a long gig. We get there at like seven in the morning. We don't get out till 1230 in the afternoon. Um, and we, I think we do three, two or three. The tr <laughs> no, no, it's not the trumpet, God. <laughs> That's Anthony saying that. Um, I don't remember if it's two or three services, maybe two. Um, but yes, it's extremely loud. You know, the only church I've ever played that was louder than that, I played one time at a Romanian church service, and that was even louder. So me personally, I'm not into loud stuff like that. I'm, I, I don't like playing in loud ensembles. I'm good at it. I think that's why for a lot of a lot of the gigs I played for over a period of 25 years, the reason they hired me was because, you know, I told you that that playing loud like that paralyzes your playing. However, if you really work at it, you can you can learn to to at least get by. You will never play as well that loud as you do when you're not playing loud. That's that's mathematical, right? But you can at least learn to play loud better than other people, right? And that's how I ended up playing a lot of um, <laughs> so <laughs> Bota, who's <laughs> He says, my Romanian's playing loud? Impossible. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I couldn't believe how, how, how loud that was. <laughs> Tips on playing high notes. What would you like to know about high notes, Shay? And hello, Shay. I think I, this is, I don't know if this is your first time, but welcome to the, the trumpet. Q and A, um, but let me know. Let me know what kind of questions you specific questions you might have about playing high notes. Um, if you just ask me tips about high notes, I'll tell you to go get my one range book. <laughs> right, that's the best tip I have. Go get my one range book. But if you have specific questions, um, so the one range book tells you how to get the how to get your range to be connected from the top notes to the bottom notes without sacrificing the rest of what you do 
in other words, it's, it's a, 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 a way of approaching range that's more natural. Gabriel says, I have a tip to play high. Stand on a chair and play. <laughs> it will be very high. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Oh, Javier says, um, any trick to not run out of endurance while playing loud? Well, that's the trick, isn't it? That's the problem. So let me tell you what, what my philosophy is about endurance. And it, it applies to your question. We we haven't really talked much about endurance in, in these Q&As. So let me tell you that the, my approach to endurance has two sides to it. We have the side that everybody else talks about, right? Um, where you build up the strength. That's what everyone talks about, building up the strength. But that's never enough. You can build all the strength you want and you're still going to fall short. So the other side of endurance, and in fact, I even have, I think, if I'm not mistaken, a video called The Other Side of Endurance. It's a horrible video because I didn't hit all the points I wanted to hit. Um, and maybe I can do a better job right now. When we're playing... There's okay, and, and this side of it has, has two parts to it. The first part is we never use endurance as an excuse to sound bad. So, what I've discovered over the years of playing these very physical gigs, what I've discovered is that what happens a lot of times is people get tired and then they throw in the towel. They quit. What do I mean by quit? They quit trying to sound good because they now have an excuse for sounding bad. They start getting tired and then they start letting the sound go. Right? They start they start letting the whatever muscles collapse that need to collapse. And and you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me, and I should probably get back into this now that my heart is back to normal again. Um, it reminds me of long distance running. When you're at that end where, where, of the run where your, your, your fatigue is really kicked in. Now, if you look... If you look at the running magazines and all that other stuff, go to the running mag uh, websites, watch running videos. They stress so much that when you start getting tired, you have to maintain form. You don't let yourself start slouching over because you're tired. You have to, whatever form that you use when you're running, you have to keep that form even though you're tired. That's what long distance running is all about. If you if you can't hold yourself up, if you can't hold your posture up, you can't make that kind of distance because it's the same mental, the same mindset. Now you look at how the horn works that way. If you can't do all the stuff that gives you a great sound when you're tired, All you're going to do is, you know, I, I worded that the wrong way. Let's word it in the affirmative instead of the negative. Let's say when you get tired, you have to, no matter how aching your lips are, no matter how uncomfortable your face is, you have to hold in position and still get that most beautiful sound that you can get. You have to. And that's a big part of endurance. People think I have more endurance than I do because I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. They call me a workhorse. 
that was years ago, but the, it's you know I still play that way. So they they call me a workhorse because I don't stop getting a good sound. They think I'm not tired. <laughs> they think I'm, and and inside you know I'm playing this this beautiful phrase, and inside my mind I'm going, oh this hurts. <laughs> <laughs> if you could like pop into my mind and hear what's going on inside of my mind, I'm saying, please, please, please don't drop the note. Don't drop the note. <laughs> but out front is coming a beautiful sound. Okay. So that's, that's the first half of the second part of my approach to endurance is that you keep doing what you have to do, even though you're tired. The second half of that is that you take every single opportunity that you can to get micro micro rest, right? So if you've got even two or three beats of rest, take the horn off your lips. Salvage. Oh, and here's another thing, by the way. This is another part of it. Playing in style gives you stretches your endurance farther playing with musical phrasing stretches your your um endurance farther and why is that um phrasing involves ups and downs of volume so even though you're playing at a higher volume you don't want to play full full volume all the time because that's not musical right so instead of, you know, normally you might do phrases that come like this. At full volume, you're going to be more like this. Okay? The baseline volume is much higher, right? And you're just going to compress the wave. you got to compress the, the shape of the, of the phrase so that the, the top of it is a little bit... Um, less exaggerated than if you were playing down here. I hope that makes sense. Same thing with style. What is style? In my world, I have to say it that way because I know other people see it different ways, right? In my world, style is the shape of the note. Now, what, what do we mean by shape of the note? We want, so like, and you know where I learned this? I, I had a class in college uh, electronic music. This is before MIDI. And we used a ARP Odyssey. And on the ARP Odyssey, uh, which is a, it's a synthesizer, right? On the ARP Odyssey, they had this thing called the ADSR. ADSR. ADSR is, stands for Attack, Delay, Sustain, Release. That's how I learned about style by doing it electronically before MIDI even came out, right? So you have the attack. What does the attack look like? What does the delay look like? What does the sustain look like? And what does the release look like? You can shape all that stuff on in your face when you're playing the horn. Now, when we hear someone that plays totally loud, like everything they do is full volume, we say that they have no style, and it's not just an insult. It's not just emotional, okay? It's impossible to pl play with style at full volume. So let's say this is a note, right? The note is on and goes to full volume, and it's off. And it's on, and then it's off. There's no style there. A note that has style looks more like this, right? It has almost like a Christmas tree shape to it. A note that has style, well, there's there's other styles too, right? You can have like the football shape, which is more legato. But what gives it that shape is the 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 volume of the note going up and down. So when you have something that is full volume, there's no, there's no style, there's no phrasing. Now, if you make yourself do style, 
you're giving yourself a boost in endurance because you're not playing full volume all the way through the note. And the same thing is true with phrasing. Now, here's the, the, the amazing part of this. People who play with style are perceived as having louder volume than the people who play up at full volume. And why is that? Because when you play at full volume, there's nothing to compare it to. Okay? The context is just one volume. You don't get you don't you don't get perception from one volume. The perception of volume comes from contrast. So when you have a note or a phrase that does something like that, this here is actually perceived as something that's loud. I hope that makes sense. So that's my biggest thing. So that's that's how I approach endurance. Yes, build the muscles. Do that. Build the muscles. But also over here, don't quit when you get tired. And give yourself every benefit during the performance. Okay? I hope I spent quite a bit of time on that. Let me go to the other questions. I hope that answered your question. Um Gabriel says, I have a tip. Oh, well, we already did that. Okay. Um, Bota says, now, seriously, amateur bands like the one I play in usually play loud, having many beginning beginners. Yeah, so that, you know, this band, so don't, don't, the, the Romanian band I played with was mostly guitars. And they had amps. <laughs> That's why it was loud. They... <laughs> They had PA system with stacks of speakers and stuff like that, and it was turned up to 11. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I'm not. I don't think that um, instrumental bands like like you know like um, strings and 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 woodwinds and brass. I don't could, think could possibly ever play out loud like that without a PA system. Um, Shay says, "Yes, my first time." I'm having trouble with my embouchure when trying to play higher, as well as airspeed. Thanks. Okay, so my approach to playing higher has to do with familiarity. And seriously, what, what we want to do, I, I really recommend the One Range book because it addresses exactly that kind of stuff. Um, what we want to do is, is instead of trying to play higher, we want to determine where is our top range and take everything that we do, exercises and music, um, and all your exercises, not just some of the exercises, everything you do up to your top range, your long tones go up to your top range. Your lip slurs go to your top range. Uh, articulation, top range. Okay? By doing that, you start playing those notes more subconsciously instead of trying to do it with your, your conscious mind. That's part of it. And things like embouchure and airspeed work themselves out now, I'm not one of those guys that just thinks just because this happens this way that nobody should ever work on their embouchure. I'm not saying that. There's a lot of truth to that school, but there's also a lot of people that are so messed up with their embouchures. Someone told them something wrong along the way, and you're not going to fix that naturally. So I do believe there are times when we fix embouchures because someone somewhere along the way, and it doesn't even have to be like a teacher that told you something wrong, right? It could have been just something you misunderstood. 
So there are times like that when we need to work on the embouchure and get get your more. It's when we work on the embouchure. It's more about how you think than it is about what's going on here. Okay. But once we get that worked out, and if that's not a problem, then the the way you do this range development stuff really should be more natural. And what's not natural is when you go over your natural range and try to get the notes. That's when stuff like airspeed and embouchure start getting messed up. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And if you want to know more about that, that's the stuff that my one range book talks about. Okay, I have no problem answering your questions here. We are out of time now, but you can come back next week if you have more questions or you can email me. Um, but uh, but I don't mind I don't mind answering more questions. But the best way to learn what I'm teaching about the high notes is to go to that one range book, okay? Um, Javier says, keeping up with endurance even if you modify your embouchure temporarily? Um, so I'm not quite sure I understand what you're asking. Keeping up with endurance even if you modify your embouchure. So when you change your embouchure, Okay, so you're saying temporarily. Yeah, I'm confused. <laughs> so you're, you'll have to reword that. I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're asking. Gabriel says, the micro rest gave me a different world. So I guess we've talked about that already, huh, Gabriel? Um, the, the micro rests make a huge difference. And along with the style, too, the style thing is and it gives you a lot more endurance. Shadow95 says, my favorite note is double D or double B. <laughs> is that a ball size? That's Javier. If I keep gaining weight, that's going to be my ball size. That's Anthony. <laughs> hey, Anthony, we're going to have to get together this week, huh? Why don't you email me and tell me what, what days or times you can you can meet and we'll try to set something up. Hyomad Genario. This howdy, thank you for coming out. Any tips for improvising for Allstate? Um I'll tell you what, improvising for Allstate this year is easy cheesy. Okay, here's my tip. And now this depends on what your level is. If you're not very good at all, at, if, you, if you're just a beginner, let me not say not very good. If you're just a beginner, the way you approach those two tracks, the, the one for like autumn leaves is just play in the key of C. Right? Don't worry about the chords, just play in the key of C. Just play, improvise on the C major scale until you get to the end. That's, you know, now if, if, if you're way more advanced than that, then I, I would need to have a more, a more, um, what do you call it? A more detailed question. So, but yeah, if, because I don't know, I don't know exactly what level you're at, right? So if you're advanced, then I don't know that I would have tips, so to speak, um, except for in terms of competition. Let's talk about the competition part of it. Don't freak out. <laughs> that's the, the, that's my tip. Don't freak out. Okay. I judged all state jazz Five times, I think it was. I never heard in all that time, including my students, by the way, I never heard one audition in all those five years that I thought deserved to go to Allstate. 
in all those five years, not one audition. There were maybe a couple that came close. Nobody struck me as anybody that deserved to go to Allstate. That's not how it works. They, they take whoever's at the top. But my, my understanding walking away from that experience is that I don't, I don't think that the students are that bad. I think they just freak out. Oh, it's Allstate, and they freak out. It's a little this different this year because you guys are, are, are taping, right? But I think a lot of times you guys sound horrible because you you care too much about whether you're going to win or not. And you just need to, to, to chill out, <laughs> enjoy the process, relax. Oh, I don't like saying relax. I take that back. I take that back. I don't like relaxing because that opens up a can of worms I don't like. Um, be calm. Let, instead of using the word relax, let's just say be calm, okay? Um, so, yeah, just be calm. Don't, don't, um, and the other thing I would say is don't try to impress anybody. You don't impress anyone by trying to impress anybody, okay? Shay says, thanks. What days and time do you go? Do you go? Okay, so this, this is always, right now anyway, um, Friday at 1 o'clock, okay? Friday at 1 o'clock. If you, if you can't be here because, um, because of school or whatever, then you can send me an email and I can answer the question um, either in the email or in, because you can watch these afterwards, right? Anyway, Shadow95 says, a quadrilateral G is almost impossible. <laughs> oh, you guys. Yeah, submitting a recording is weird but gives a better chance for making and perfecting the recording. Yeah, did you see my video on that? You want to be careful with that. Perfection is not so cool. It will, I call it, what did I call it? Don't let greed kill your audition. Something like that. It's, it's like two or three videos back. Um, anyway, maybe answer one more question before I go. All right, so um, what's my favorite jazz standard? I don't know that I have a favorite. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have a favorite. I would, it would, it's, you know, I don't have a, a, a lot of favorites like that. I mean, I have, to, or you could say I have too many favorites to say that I've got a favorite. Um, Yeah, I don't know. But that's a good question. Anyway, okay, so very good, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. God bless you guys. Um, we will see you next week. Um, the gigging is starting back, but it's very, very slow. So, all right. Um, have a great week, and we'll see you next time, all right? Okay, bye.